Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'll be your host. Um, my name is Justin. And uh, while we wait uh, for maybe one more minute for everyone um, to join, um, yeah, please make yourself comfortable and we'll be on maybe in a minute. Yeah, so um, let's make a start. So thank you so much to everyone who uh, joined us today. My name is Justin Yim and I will be your host for the panel. This forum is a joint event organized by PJ, Designing Hong Kong and the Center of Community and Place Governance at the, university, uh, at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. For some quick housekeeping notes, uh, on the bottom of your screen, you will find a button for chat box and a separate button for Q&A. Please submit your questions to the panelists at the Q&A rather than in the chat. In the Q&A, panelists will be able to see your questions clearly and answer them in the discussion session. You can also upvote any questions that you find it useful for the panelists to answer. The chat box should be reserved for any comments or any insights to share to other audience. Please don't forget that the second panel of this forum, which is about placemaking and well-being and its relationship to urban design and street design will be taking place this Thursday at the same time. You can sign up by scanning the QR code uh, on the right hand side of your screen if you're interested and haven't done so. I'm delighted to introduce our speakers for the day. To begin, we will have Phil Jones, the chairman of PJ um, and the co-author of Manual for Streets 1 and 2. Paul Zimmerman, the CEO of Designing Hong Kong. Professor Peter Jones, Professor of Transport and Sustainable Development at the University College London, and Anna Rose, Director of Space and Tax. I'm also delighted to have uh, invited Julian Kwong, the Chairman of Community for Road Safety with us, who will be responding to the panelists after present their presentations. Now it's time for the first presentation by Phil. Phil is the Founder and Chairman of PJ, a leading independent transport planning, design, engineering, and placemaking consultancy with offices in the UK and Australia. Phil has over 35 years of experience in the planning and design of transport infrastructure in existing places and new developments. He specializes in achieving the synergy between street and urban design with the aim of creating streets, spaces, and places that meet social, aesthetics, and functional aims. Now it's time for me to hand the air time to Phil. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justin. And uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, taking part in, in, in this um, webinar um, and, to, and for our practice to have helped to organise it. Um, so I will give you my impression. I've, I've only been to Hong Kong a couple of times for fairly briefly. Um, so I very much relied on Justin's uh, uh, conversation with Justin about how some of the concepts that we've been thinking about in the UK and other, and, and I know are being taken up in other parts of the world, um, can apply to Hong Kong. But I, I'm really looking forward to hearing from from others and, and having a discussion. So I want to kind of give a, a bit of an overview. I hope that there isn't too much overlap um, with with the other speakers. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I'll just begin by just talking about streets and roads. Um, and, and I think we're very fortunate in the English um, that we have different words for street and for road uh, and how they contribute to making good places. Um, I think that's certainly true of other languages as well. 
So Manual for Streets, which, which Justin mentioned, is a document that came out. I'll say a bit more about it later. Um, and and it, it, it was a reaction in a way to the design manual for roads, roads and bridges that we've, we've had for a long time in the UK. But there was just not an appropriate design guide for how we design urban streets. So Manual for Streets talked about streets having um, public realm functions. It's not about the volume of traffic, it's about what their other functions are. Whereas a road, uh, its main function is to take you to somewhere else. And I think we, we kind of understand that, that these are um, obviously share a lot of similarities and there are some blurred divisions between them, but I think we can understand the differences. A street is a place, a road takes you to another place. Um, and, and, and this thinking, this is from um, uh, Hans Mondeman, suddenly passed away a few years ago, he was a road safety engineer from Friesland in uh, northern uh, Netherlands. Um, and he talked about what are considered to be good aspects of roads, that they're regulated, they're impersonal, linear, they have this single purpose, they're predictable, we, we control them with, with signs and, and markings. Um, through through the state, um, and and I hope this is going to work. But um, I, I asked low. Yeah, low. I, I asked Justin um, if if Cantonese had a separate word for roads and streets, and I'm very pleased that, like English, it it does. So there we are. I'll I'll it, hopefully low. There you go. Hope you've heard that. That's that's uh, my understanding. Is Cantonese for for road. Um, um, and streets. Uh, if you look at it, they are uh, they have a set of of, of characteristics that is um, completely polar opposite to road. So where a road is regulated by the state, a street is defined by the culture of the people who use it. It's personal, it's a space, it's not linear, it's multi-purpose, constantly changing. And, and so the fact that these um, characteristics are in opposition to each other, what that means is that the more that we bring in road thinking into our cities, the worse our cities become. And, and I know you're waiting for me to, to play this one, so. Guy. Guy. Okay, that is, I understand uh, Cantonese for street. So I'm very, say, very pleased that um, uh, like English, it has this different word. Okay, so, so um, what we can think about is a street or a good street um, has these two principal functions. I know Peter Jones will talk a lot more about this is really the prime thinker behind this philosophy. This idea that a street is, is um, uh, yes, it has this movement function. It takes you somewhere else. It is the movement um, arteries of a city and a, and a place, uh, a, a settlement, but it also has this, this place function. Um, this is just you know somewhere to be, to have a coffee, to shop, to stroll around, to meet people uh, and to engage in social activities. Um, and, and so what do we mean by place? You know, it's, it's a very difficult thing to pin down, actually. And I think we sort of know it when we see it. So this is, this is, this is a, perhaps an academic definition and spaces to which meaning, feeling or emotional attachment have been given. And the photograph uh, on the right is where I live. It's a, it's a village, it's a small town in um, the English Midlands. Uh, it's called Kinva. And I obviously have a lot of attachment to that place. I've lived here for over, over 25 years now. Um, my colleague Annabelle, who's our lead urban designer, she just said, well, it's a place where you want to spend some time, which I thought was quite a nice way of thinking about it. Where do you spend time? You don't want to be somewhere else. You just want to be there. And maybe a simpler definition is it's nice here, isn't it? You know, I think we kind of know that when we when we see it. Um, uh, and so we, we, as engineers and planners, we're very good at putting numbers on things and movement and traffic um, is great. We can analyze it, we can count it, we can observe it, we can, we can put it on a scale. But when we, when we get into the realm of place, it's a much more difficult thing to pin down, as I, as I say. You know, place is to do with the cultural associations, is to do with the views, is to do with the activities, is to do with people crossing the road and getting to somewhere else, is to do with car parking, um, and, and all of these things. And it's a very hard thing to put on some kind of measure, but I think we all now agree that it's really, really important uh, when we come to our urban streets. Um, but unfortunately, if we go back to kind of conventional motor traffic based road hierarchy, and this, this is from American thinking where they would divide their um, highway network into three types, arterial roads, collector roads and local roads. And what it says is that um, mobility increases where you come onto the arterials and, and access, access that, that's, if you like, the, the um, direction of movement at 90 degrees to the main movement into the, into the buildings, into the cafes into the residential or, 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 the, or the public realm. 
Um, that you can only really have that when you come to local streets. So there's no place in that conventional traffic uh, hierarchy for what in the UK we would call a high street, like the image I just showed, where we have both a high movement function and a high access or place function. Uh, and that's an issue uh, that we've, we've tried to address. Um, but it, it, taking a step back, why, does, why do streets matter at all? Why do we care about these things? Well, uh, these are some reasons I think um, I think it, we, we know if, you, if we look at an aerial photograph of, of any city, so we have Barcelona at the top and, and then uh, a, a UK suburban area and a, an American suburban area, the, the street patterns are very different. And so they, 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 um, they actually constitute a lot of what uh, the public realm is. They also last a very long time and therefore they're how we feel, how we access, how we experience, how we get that sense of place. And so they're absolutely key to the identity of towns and cities. And so they, they say they last a very long time. Oxford, uh, many of you really know, historic city in, in, the, in South of England. Um, and, it, and it actually was a planned medieval settlement uh, around a crossing of the, of the River Thames where oxen used to cross, hence a ford uh, used by ox to cross the River Thames. And it was a gridded settlement uh, based around that with a wall and a castle. And you can see from the aerial photograph on the right that much of the street pattern has actually endured. It, 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 it has lasted getting on for a millennium and is unlikely to change anytime soon. So once we lay down these street patterns and we, we as designers make choices, we are making choices that, that are indefinite. There is no, in many, many places, it's very unlikely they will change. And this is one of those streets in Oxford, Oxford High Street, it's a beautiful street um, lined with buildings. And, and the point I'd like to say is it was, it's, it's, it's a beautiful place. Um, and the buildings in this photograph are um, much less old than the street that, on which they lie. Um, and so the, 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 while they will change and their uses will change, the street pattern will remain. The other thing I'd like to say about this photograph is that it gets across the idea that, that a street is a three dimensional space. And while the traffic engineers and the highway engineers are probably responsible for the ground plane and what goes on there, and architects are responsible for the vertical plane, the buildings that, that frame it, it's the, it's the combination of those things that actually makes the street uh, what it is. Um, and of course, this is a very beautiful image. In reality, this is what it really looks like. You know, it's, it, for much of the time, it's a little bit too busy and it's full of buses and actually doesn't have a ter terrifically good um, collision record. So we need to do something about it. But nevertheless, uh, you know, it is a great asset to the city and perhaps one that is a little bit been degraded by excess um, motor traffic uh, in recent years. Um, and, and so, you know, streets, um, the, I took this, this image from some Edwardian um, uh, videos and, and films that you can see of, of streets. We, at one time, pre-motor car, our streets were very active places. People did mingle on the street. They did meet the, the, the traffic and the vehicles that were moving there, the trams and horses were moving slowly enough. And, and in the cases of trams and, and cyclists, predictably enough so that people could mix with them. And it was really the arrival of the motor car that pushed people away from these mixed streets in, into the margins. And, you know, it was the arrival of the motor car and, and in Germany in the 1930s that the engineers began to apply mathematics to the design of these initially roads based around the physics of the moving vehicle, its curv the, the, the curvature, the side friction, all the rest of it, and, and super elevation that we're so familiar with as highway engineers and brought that thinking into the cities. And, and as I say, from the work of Hans Mondeman, actually began to erode the quality of those urban streets by the over-application of, of these highway standards. And, 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 and perhaps at, around the same time, um, it, it, perhaps in reaction to some of the perhaps less attractive streets that we had in our urban areas, concerns about sanitation and lack of light, led architects like Le Corbusier to say, we must kill the narrow street, that this is not appropriate in the right, if, we, if, if the motor car is going to come to dominate our cities uh, and, we need, and we need to take advantage of that by opening our cities, the Ville Radieuse, the, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, um, the sunlit city, um, uh, and, and move to this where we could not now tolerate because of these fast moving heavy vehicles that are coming into our cities, we can no longer share the space. Uh, and, and we therefore must separate pedestrians um, vertically in this image uh, from, from these cars and open it up 
uh, and and create light and air and 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 health and this was considered to be healthy and progressive um and it's really kind of interesting how has that been applied in in hong kong well hong kong i i, you know, I don't need uh, me to tell you is is uh exceptional uh, uh uh globally in terms of the density of its population and therefore uh commendably the low with the lowest level very low levels of per capita gasoline use so on the one hand, we have an op Hong Kong. Um, we know it's very walkable, in, and we'll talk about that in, uh, in in three dimensions and so on. But it perhaps has the opportunity to to turn its back on motordom uh, and and to uh, to really create a, a pedestrian dominated city. Um, and but in perhaps again in reaction to those narrow lanes that we saw from Le Corbusier or uh, and other considerations, Hong Kong, like many other parts of the world has embraced the idea of big roads uh, and, and, uh, and wide boulevards, really with uh, quite high levels of, of car dominance uh, in many parts of, of the city. Um, and and I, I took this image, this is a, um, a visit I made to Hong Kong in 2019. This is the same junction. I think for me, kind of shows the contrast that is going on here. It, it, literally these photographs were taken 90 degrees apart. So what we have on the left is a, is a mixed use street with active frontages. It's a three dimensional space. There's a close relationship between the buildings and, and, and the ground plane. And then you turn to your right and then we're into uh, a world of point blocks with, with no active frontages with very wide um, uh, junctions uh, and the whole thing controlled and rather car, car dominated. Um, and, and much of Hong Kong, um, I, I think, you know, still uh, has difficulty and, and there's a very high levels of use of pedestrian guard railing so that the, the carriageway is reserved for, for cars. There is a lot of concern about people perhaps spilling onto the street, perhaps because of the high numbers of pedestrians. There is this feeling that there will be inefficiencies and road safety issues if that very rigid distinction between the pedestrian realm and the vehicle realm was broken was broken down, and we moved back to the kind of images that I saw, you know, with the uh, Edwardian um, streets. And, and perhaps I know that um, uh, uh, Paul will talk about this, but it is 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 one of the, re the the reactions to that, or or perhaps a reason why that's been tolerated that your streets, many of your urban streets, are still quite carbon dominated, is because you've created in Hong Kong these these. Uh, wonderful pedestrian realms away from the street where people can really be free of motor traffic uh, and, and engage in, in, uh, in other activities. Um, but I know that Hong Kong is moving. So um, uh, the work is being done uh, by the authorities to, to look at the block and how within, within um, perhaps uh, larger blocks, more can be given to prioritize pedestrians and to think about how the link in place idea might apply uh, if, if not to the whole street, at least to the pedestrian realm, to recognise that, that uh, like streets, pedestrian routes also have this uh, dual function of link and place. So, but where, where have we come from in the UK? I thought I'd just you know, talk a little bit about um, our journey in this. So up until uh, 2007, uh, uh, national standards for residential roads uh, was this, the design bulletin 32. And while it said some pretty good things about the needs of pedestrians, it was still very numbers based, uh, very much around counting dwelling. So very focused on the measurement of movement, uh, which as I say, engineers uh, being mathematically trained are very comfortable with. But the, the, the feeling was that that was simply becoming inappropriate for the design of our new residential streets. So Manual for Streets was published in 2007 and tried to put on this idea that as well as providing for, for movement, um, the streets had this um, place function around quality of life and really trying to kind of open the eyes of, of traffic and highway engineers to the, the importance uh, within uh, people's lives of the, of the infrastructure that they were creating. Um, a few years later, that was followed by Manual for Streets 2, um, which there's no new message in Manual for Streets 2. It is simply um, written to try to extend the principles of that first document beyond just residential streets um, to give engineers the more confidence to apply those principles of pedestrian first in, in uh, busier locations and to try to move engineers away from the comfort of familiar, familiar standards. Um, and uh, I won't go into any, a great detail because I know Peter will talk about it, but again, um, 
uh, Manifest Treaty 1 and 2 try to move away from that rigid traffic authority to recognise that streets uh, had a movement status but also had a place status and that might vary and designs need to take account of both of those functions. As it says there, no longer uh, assuming place to be automatically subservient to movement, which I think many um, uh, highway engineers would, would think about. Um, other kind of key messages in Manifest Streets 1 and 2 is that we know that we can't design every street to be a pedestrianised street. We know there is a need to think about traffic and motor traffic, but we should start with thinking about walking and cycling first. If we don't consider the needs of people on foot and cycle, there are most sustainable mo modes, then we will, it's very easy to design, design them out. If we, if we start with thinking about um, traffic capacity and only then think about the needs of, of other modes, then they will come second in our consideration. So that's, it's a hierarchy of consideration uh, is, is in Manual for Streets. And, and as, a, as, a, as a little example of that, uh, and this has not been uh, held to in many places, so, but where it has, it's been quite successful, is the idea that we should think about simple things like the corner radii and junctions, because uh, if we keep corner radii tight, uh, it will slow the vehicle down, it will reduce the distance that the pedestrian has to cross and will make the whole thing safer and more pro-pedestrian. And that's a, just a simple thing as a, as a, as a sort of manif manifestation of that hierarchy of consideration. And, and I'm pleased to say actually in about three days time, and I was very pleased to be able to be part of the writing of this, uh, our, new, our highway code, which is the, the rules in which all, all you, people use the road in the UK is about to be updated and will strengthen the rule uh, and make it much clearer that drivers are expected to give way to pedestrians when they're waiting to cross a junction. And so we can have more confidence that that, that kind of approach is going to be appropriate. Um, other key messages in Manual for Streets is about this relationship, as I said, with, with Oxford between the buildings and the street itself, that's, that's hugely important. And moving away from the image on the right, which Design Bulletin 32 used to give us of the local distributor road that was really just designed for movement. Uh, other things that Manifest Streets talks about is the relationship between visibility and speed. We, rather than um, determining our visibility because of a design speed, we can use visibility and close the visibility down and give us some confidence that actually that will help to reduce traffic speeds as well. The driver is not a robot. So here's an example from Poundbury, which is a new development. It looks pretty old, but it's actually new. It's on land that is owned by Prince Charles, future King of the UK, King of England. And, um, and this is a two-way street with a, with a very um, blind bend. Uh, and yet, you know, that has not had a, a, an accident problem. Uh, and what it means is the drivers slow down as they go around that corner. But unfortunately, um, Manifest Streets 1 and 2 have not perhaps had the impact that they, uh, that they should have done. Uh, when it was drafted, we tried to keep the numbers down and make people think about place. Um, but actually, I had a meeting, I remember a few years ago, um, with an engineer who said, I can't work to Manifest Streets. There's not enough codification in it. It's just not certain enough. It's too fluffy um, and we need to make it stronger. So I'm pleased to say that a new Manifest Streets is, is in the course of preparation. It will bring together one and two with our current planning system and is due for publication uh, later this year. And hopefully that will give greater certainty. So, so please kind of watch out for that. Uh, I'm, so I'm running a little bit behind time, but I'll just try and speak through the last few slides. And um, uh, another kind of key message that's come out of the, the thinking around Manifest Streets 1 and 2 is this idea that, that our streets are just full of clutter and, and, and stuff that is only there because of the high volume of motor traffic, particularly guardrail. And these are some images that show how a street scene is massively degraded by the signs that are in front of us. And if we just take those away and put them on the building, suddenly the street scene and the buildings are revealed. And these images are in Manifest Streets 2. Um, and uh, just to show, London has really led the way on that. So this, this is uh, just outside uh, um, Hyde Park, Hyde Park Corner, um, and how the guard rally was there, um, as you can see, in 2008. And for the Olympics in 2012, that was all cleared away and has not led to an increase in collisions. It's actually been found to be um, to not have a problem. And drivers actually travel more slowly when they don't have the certainty that pedestrians are behind that guardrail. Uh, and so it has not led to the increasing collisions that some people did fear. And I'm pleased to say again, 
Um, uh, Hong Kong is beginning to, to look at this, um, seeing some images um, uh, that signs are being taken out, and in places, some of the guardrail is being taken out as well, which is, which is good to see. Um, obviously, it uh, has to be taken very carefully, um, but that is the move. And then finally, I just wanted to say a last few words about speed, because things are moving on. Um, in this arena too in the UK uh, and around the world generally. So 20, uh, uh, Justin, to remind me to say that we still work in miles per hour. So 20 is 30 kilometers, more or less, 33 kilometers. We increasingly see the use, seeing the use of 20 miles per hour, 30 kilometers per hour. Speed, limit, speed limits, even on roads that have no traffic calming uh, uh, like this one. So this is, this is just to show, give you a feel for the extent of that now. So in the, uh, the image, on the left in London, all of the roads in green, streets in green, uh, are have now a 20 miles per hour speed limit. Uh, in Bristol, all the roads and streets in blue, and it's been calculated that is leading to an, an average saving per year of four and a half casualties, sorry, four and a half fatalities and 170 casualties. So that is increasingly uh, being seen as the norm. So here um, on Waterloo Bridge, you can see a, a very major um, arterial, um, uh, probably is a road actually in, in, in London, it doesn't have much place function. Uh, and, and that's um, now become uh, uh, 20 miles per hour, 30 kilometers per hour. Um, so much of central London now has that speed. Um, and I'm doing some work with the Welsh government and uh, uniquely in uh, England, among, sorry, in the UK, amongst the, the four nations that make up the United Kingdom, Wales has, has uh, in the last couple of years has voted that uh, 20 miles per hour will be the default urban limit. So local authorities can choose a different limit, um, but if they don't, if, if, they, if they leave it the way the, uh, the norm is, then every road that has uh, and street that has street lighting uh, will automatically have a 20 miles per hour speed limit. And that's likely to be from next year, from the middle of 2023. Obviously other um, nations in the UK and around the world are gonna be watching very closely to see the experience of Wales uh, on that. So um, that's, I'm just about done. So that's my, my final thought. I think what I'll leave you with the thought is that there is a difference between streets and roads. And I'm, I'm pleased that Cantonese, like the English, has that difference. Um, uh, and we've made a lot of progress, we hope, in the UK. And I know other countries have, have gone down this route as well. But we have much more to do. And so I'm very much hoping to learn um, from Hong Kong's experience, learn from each other. I think we all need to do that. Um, with the aim uh, generally of making better streets for people. So um, thank you very much indeed. Thanks Phil for uh, introducing a strategic look on the row of streets and how they are different from roads um, in their design and how uh, potentially we could design them uh, differently for a better livability in cities. Um, so our next speaker will be Paul Zimmerman. Paul is a, an elected councillor at the Southern District of Hong Kong, representing the Parfilm constituency. He's the CEO of Designing Hong Kong, a nonprofit organization devoted to improving urban planning, design, and livability of Hong Kong, and is now full time dedicated to public service. He champions these courses by advocating good planning and sustainable development through many NGOs and alliances. He was awarded an honorary membership at the American Institute of Architects Hong Kong for its role in improving the harbour front of the Victoria Harbour. I'll now hand over the time to Paul. Thanks, uh, Justin. I'm, I'm speaking here uh, from Hong Kong, but uh, my background there is, is, a, is, is simply a picture. I, I, you would be jealous if that would be my office with that view behind me. Um, but um, I, I will get back to the centre of Hong Kong. Hong Kong, really, walkability is a um, is a challenge and uh, it has also uh, been embraced in Hong Kong to the point that um, uh, you can walk a lot, you can walk very far. Uh, a lot of people walk a lot. Um, uh, we've got some of the highest step counts in the world. Uh, so um, we don't see a lot of fat people, we a lot of skinny people in Hong Kong because everybody walks a lot as part of their, their journey. Uh, people don't sit in a car very often uh, most people are uh, are using public transport, and part of using public transport is that they have to walk as well to get there, and and from there to their destination. And to get to transport, they have to also do quite a bit of walking. So um, so the, it, it, walking is interesting in our city. Part of that is this uh, this configuration 
which I think this photograph tells quite well, which I've nicked from my good friend Chiariada at, at Hong Kong U. Um, the heart of the city is a harbor. Uh, so uh, which, which makes the city to go around the harbor. Uh, and then where any other city may have ring roads um, that go on the outside of the city, we got mountains. Um, and um, so our ring roads tend to be now within the city and we're making an effort to put them underground in the city. So we, we're, we will very soon be completing another section of the road that gives us a ring road that, that runs through the heart of, uh, under the underground from the heart of the city. The central ones are bypassed, the tunnels under the harbor and then linked to the central Kowloon route uh, that goes through Kowloon and that kind of brings it all underground. So we're making that effort to, uh, uh, to put the major highway um, underground, but in main parts of the city, we have a lot of these highway, these main roads that, that, that are there and which, which creates complications for, for walkability. Uh, but anyway, this is, uh, this is how the city has grown. Um, we, uh, we, we did a lot of reclamation to create flat land to build on. Um, and that has had led to this configuration of uh, our unique city. The great advantage is, uh, like for me this morning, uh, I walked out of, uh, out of the, uh, my uh, residence and then uh, made my way onto the peak of the mountain. And I got back down to my home, had a shower and went to work, which allowed me within 10 minutes uh, leaving the door, I'm in absolute nature, uh, I'm climbing. Um, and it's great for fitness and it's great for health, uh, but that opportunity is provided by having this unique uh, city shape. Um, so yeah, so most of the people live in this very high dense environment, uh, which means that if you need to get from one meeting to another meeting, uh, it usually doesn't take you very far and it doesn't take you very long. Um, so uh, in, the, in the core financial district, People can walk from one office, from one meeting room to another meeting meet the room, meeting room within a few minutes. As far as they do that, uh, with all the Zoom calls these days, uh, but everything is so close and so tight. Whereas, you know, when I'm in London and I try to get from my son's to my friend's place, um, you know, the, it, transport takes a long time to get from. And this reduces the number of meetings you can hold in a day. Um, so there's a great efficiency in this very. Uh, tight layout of the city. Uh, it gives us massive nature and it gives us real directness in, and, and an opportunity to have lots of business meetings in, in, in a day. So there's great advantages of being sparse with our land use uh, and be very dense with it, but it creates challenges for, from a walkability point of view. Again, uh, Elaine has put it, mapped out some of these uh, walking paths and roads onto the mountain shape. So you can have an idea for the, the density of that road network on the flatland and then how it climbs up the mountain together with uh, the mostly residential up the mountain. Um, again, this is uh, this pretty much almost like a heat map, uh, uh, give you indicates the kind of where we have a, a lot of movement and, and, and uh, linkages as well as movement. And then especially in those areas where uh, the MTRs are locations, high residential, high commercial areas. Um, and uh, so, so the density, and that's what Phil just shown, uh, the kind of busy streets that we have, the busy sidewalks that we have are in those areas uh, where we, a lot of people have to fight for very little space. I think our, our road network is extremely short. Um, and, uh, and so the density of number of vehicles per kilometer road, I believe is still uh, the second highest, the first highest being Monaco. Um, but I guess that's all fancy cars in car parks, but here we've got trucks and buses moving. And uh, so we have a very high, despite we have a low car ownership, um, the density of vehicles per road is very high because that road network is so extremely short, as, as you can tell here. So. There is a battle for space, um, and especially in the older urban areas where you cannot change those uh, privately held land lots very easily. We have the same as Phil highlighted that uh, as well, where in these inner cities in England, you cannot just create more road space. People own properties there, uh, so you have to deal with the space you got. And, and, and Hong Kong has that absolute same challenge. Um, 
which then you know we, we we're having an the, the harsh reality of, of this is an NTR station in, in, in Kowloon, um, that you have this kind of configurations existing as well. Um, it's not everywhere. Uh, as you saw in Phil's pictures earlier on, we have lovely street street areas with, with shop frontages where it's busy walking around. Uh, but this is also a, a significant part of our uh, 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 pedestrian network in Hong Kong where we got to get people out of these high density areas in the train station, out of the train station. Um, the advantage is you could, you know, in, you, you can roll from your bed, even when there is a typhoon, you can roll from your bed into the lift, into the walkway, into the train, and then back. And sometimes you do see that, you see people in their pajamas in the MTR station, but um, it's, it's, there, is, there is a quality to it, but there is also, of course, a lot of negatives to it. If, if I'm living, in these older buildings that you see on the right of the picture. And I wanna to go to the waterfront, which you cannot see in this picture, but just further to the left, um, you'll have to navigate your way through the MTR station walkways. Um, and if you are not familiar with the territory and you're a tourist on the ground, you'll have a hard time finding your way. So there are, there are challenges that come with this uh, street pattern. Um, this kind of like an artistic way is it's it's uh, city without ground. There's a little book published uh, uh, by a team in Hong Kong U, and they kind of exploded the uh, the networks that we do have. And this is in in um, uh, the walking networks that we have. And this is in a, in a small area in, in Admiralty. Um, and you see this kind of multi-layer network that exists. Part of that is because part of Admiralty goes up the hill. Part of that is because there's the MTR station going various, various layers deep. And then there is these commercial uh, buildings where you can walk at many different levels to do your shopping. And once you map them all out, you get and you put them onto this exploding form, you're getting this kind of really complex network, uh, which I believe is interesting for those people who are expert in syntax to see if your syntax modeling still works in an environment like this. So uh, a multi-layered syntax system has always been um, kind of a dream and a challenge for uh, for Elaine Shirada at Hong Kong U and others to kind of see how how this can be applied to Hong Kong. Um, as I said, the the, the disadvantages are uh, you get these islands where um, you have that really narrow uh, that that short road network where you're going to put a lot of capacity on um, and so you max out of the capacity, so you kind of end up with the islands. Um, and uh, with these these foot bridges that connect those islands, so uh, it, that creates this uh, challenging environment in 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 some of the districts. Now within the islands, um, of course, then you could have improved walkability. And so uh, this is uh, at Hung Hom, um, and uh, the main block in the in the middle is the uh, the Hung Hom station. So there is railings going in here. There's road links going around it because there's also the tunnel. To Hong Kong Island, there is uh, next left north um, uh, is the is the uh, Poly U, uh, so that's an island, um, and then and then you have Chin Chow so to your left. Uh, you just you see a stretch of that just off the left of the picture with the, the, the narrow road, road network that you can then walk every pavement. So there's not everywhere, but these challenges then uh, create these islands. Uh, a good friend of mine. Um, Oren Thatcher, uh, you know, has then indicated on, on a, uh, and I'm trying to run this now, um, just the connectivity between the, the, in this particular case, is a uh, the MTR station at, in Central, where you get out um, uh, to, uh, to take other transport, to go home, or uh, to go take a bus. Um, and, and so the challenges with, with multi-layered environment with all these uh, uh, many functions is how, how do you coordinate? Uh, how do you make sure that, that things line up? Um, in this case, you know, you have the, uh, the, the concourse at the, at, the, at the train station and then and the people get up into the shopping mall and then they have to go to the bus and then they have to climb down the stairs to get to the bus station because the connection between the, the, the bus station uh, across the road basically involves you taking down your, your suitcases down uh, a, a flight of stairs uh, where you have to carry them. 
So everything is perfect. Come out of the airplane, everything is smooth all the way up to this point where you have to stumble down uh, to get into a bus station. And it's, it's not my point of complaining about these things, but it's a point of identifying that if you work in such, a, um, uh, such an environment as Hong Kong, the kind of coordination of uh, between properties and, and making sure that people can have an enjoyable uh, walking experience door to door or bus to door or train to door or, or otherwise, uh, you have to do a lot of hard work in coordinating all these all that infrastructure uh, and making sure that there is a smooth uh, there's a smooth flow. Um, then, in terms of doing that. And then how do you get a, go about it in a difficult environment like Hong Kong, making sure that you, you constantly improve walkability? Uh, we have another problem. I mean, as you all know that since 1982, when Margaret Thatcher fell down the steps in Beijing, um, there has been this discussion of the handover of Hong Kong to uh, uh, back to the mainland. And that has happened now. Uh, and, and as a result, our government here has is, 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 is been, unlike the London government, has been, you know, very, has, has had to spend time on uh, the kind of relationship between Hong Kong and, and the mainland. Uh, and kind of that small group of people that run the city have been sidetracked by this extraneous event, and they're constantly still sidetracked by it. Uh, recent national security law, we have protests in the street. I mean, we have a lot of issues that the government has to do with that. Maybe a city government like Hong Kong, like London doesn't have to deal with. Uh, I believe the mayor in London probably, if the, the bus doesn't work on Monday morning, he's the one that gets the phone call and he solves it. But um, maybe not that he doesn't go that far. But here, uh, our our chief executive has a lot of other things on her plate uh, than than running this this the city. And as a result, our guidelines really are old. I mean, this is. I'm sure you can take this book and lay it next to the one that was uh, ruling road design in the UK before manual sort of streets one and two came out. And you find there's a lot of similarities with it and, and, and very few changes. So we in Hong Kong that look at our streets always kind of wish that we could do this um, and, and, and do what London has done and do what New York has done and, and um, do what England has done and do what definitely, I'm from Holland originally, uh, you know, the stuff that, is, that happens in Holland. Uh, that we make that same effort in our city. Um, and, but for that, need, we need that leadership to be focused on the little details, not just on the big things like integration with the mainland. Um, so um, uh, this is a challenge for the city. And it's a difficult city and we have a challenge on, on governance to make sure we have the capacity to kind of learn and implement and test and try out. Uh, just uh, some, some story, uh, to give you on the kind of like the, the, the challenges, but also a specific example uh, of what we face in Hong Kong. Um, this is just kind of like to show you uh, the difficulty for people to get around the city that we need to, to look after. If you have a lot of up and downs and elevated networks, uh, you know, a lot of people move around with wheels. Uh, so, uh, and that's for goods, for the work, this, to get goods out of trucks in, in and out of bu uh, buildings, not just for people with uh, elderly and 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 with kids and uh, so there are there are there are this I, I believe that this group of street users are the ones where if we follow them and we try to accommodate them then then we would do a good job and we don't uh, look after people with wheels very well um, and, you, and you can understand why if you have a multi-layered city like Hong Kong um, you know how do you get people over on the footbridge when they have garbage um, then you force them to cross the road, but then if you don't give them a crossing, then they're in conflict with the cars. Um, so, so there is, there is, there, this is, I believe, is a, is a group that's very challenged. Just um, give you uh, just kind of a focus in on one area as an example for challenges and opportunities. Um, this is uh, central. You're looking here at central, um, the the ferry piers, uh, the Hong Kong. And then the MTR logo is the MTR station that can take you to uh, the airport. There's an MTR at central below that. Uh, that's the network that runs across Hong Kong Island and takes you to Kowloon. That's the uh, shorter stops. Um, and this is the, the heart of the financial center. And now with a beautiful, uh, uh, an increasingly beautiful waterfront that is, that is being decorated and 
fitted out and starting to look really nice. Um, if you start mapping out the pedestrian uh, connectivity, then you know the street connectivity in blue and then the green areas uh, uh, in, internal and the uh, the red lines, which, uh, which is, is the, the kind of footbridge network. You start to see the kind of complexity of, of what we have in in this uh, central area of of Hong Kong. Um, just again ex explain what the network looks like. If you, you see that red, the reddish color, uh, that's the underground network. Um, unlike Chim Sai Choi in central, we have a, only a very limited underground network that is formed by these uh, these two stations, um, and then. Uh, here you can see that in yellow, and then the, these red roads are basically the roads you can't cross uh, as a pedestrian easily. They 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 they're almost highways at uh, at 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 street level. Um, if I then overlay the pedestrian network, uh, again you see then south of the the red uh, network you see basically everything is green. There's nothing red. Uh, very dense pedestrian is the old cent, uh, central. Uh, it, it's it's very busy with cars as well, but you can walk basically at street level um, everywhere. If you want to get to the beautiful harbor front, you have to get yourself over that red network, um, and that is then the blue network, the elevated network that that is the ele the uh, that is that overlays this. Um, there is a skinny one on the on the left. That goes up the mountain. Uh, those big blocky ones are basically the inter the internal areas within shopping malls and so on. And then you see these footprint links that uh, that pull it all together. And it's that's a very extensive network. Uh, when it rains and storms, uh, that's a great alternative uh, from the street to to get get yourself around. Um, so we're going to expand that network. There is a large new development recently. Uh, uh, land sold to one of the developers. It's called Site 3. Some exciting new stuff that's going to happen there, uh, which overlays it. So, but that will have a very large, again, elevated uh, uh, pedestrian capacity um, and with shopping malls, internal, uh, uh, external, viandas, balustrades, um, uh, sit out areas, park areas almost at, at elevated level. So, so the elevated network capacity in central is going to increase a lot um, uh, which is which is exciting because this is right where it's anyway better to be at elevated level so your elevated level becomes kind of your ground level and and you can stay away from these high capacity roads that uh, that that are there in in central in the future if you then on top of that blue network the blue network is almost like the concourse of uh, of an mtr station from uh, you know, from that blue network, you can get down into the ferry piers, you can get down in parking areas, you can get down into bus stations, you get down into the MTR stations, um, in, in, into the mini bus stations, into the bus stations. So, so this is really, if it's, if it's properly designed and great signage is added, um, and we make sure that the level changes are minimized, then this is a fantastic network to move between all these modes of transport that are coming together uh, in, in, in central. Um, so that it's, it provides a massive opportunity if we can get all the signs right to get all, all of you tourists who wouldn't know where to go uh, to be able to use this like you are in an NTR station uh, to get between different rail lines, catch you between all of these modes of transport. So a great opportunity that is there. Um, and then, of course, I've put these question marks here uh, and these walking signs here. So where you can get up and down onto that network and where, where, are, where are the elevation changes, where are the entrances onto that network is then, of course, something that needs a really a great amount of thought, especially uh, on the south, on the south bit of the green line of, is marked, which is a, a main uh, street. Um, how do you get from that last main street onto the blue elevated networks and how many elevation ch uh, changes are, can you make? I mean, how many uh, staircases and, and escalators are there to get you onto the blue network? Because if the blue network is that important and so many people are going to use it, you're going to face capacity constraints just on the escalators to get people onto that network. So uh, it needs something that, that needs to be thought out because all of those elevation changes are, again, the roads are fully used already by pedestrians and cars. 
so you need to use the building so you have to do deals with the private landlords to make sure that they can provide the capacity in their buildings to get people from the street onto the blue network uh, so that they can cross over to the waterfront and to all the transport facilities that are there. So it's, uh, it's again, opportunity and challenge. Then we are looking at electronic road pricing, uh, which I've indicated here with the, uh, the kind of idea that was floated by government is, is that this is the area where they have, they, they want to kind of make sure that people that go into the area are being charged, which to me is sort of a complicated choice because in fact, uh, at, at the red roads, you just want to cast the flow, but you want to get cars off the south side of these red roads. You want to get them out of central where basically everybody walks at street level. So an ERP, in my mind, would be much better if we can, it can be like this, where basically you force the cars out of the, the southern area where everybody walks at street level, force them to use the red line areas and put all your car parking facilities there. And then again, make that footbridge network so superb that it's easy for ladies with high heels and a lot of money to spend to get out of the car, use the footbridge and get down into all the shopping streets and then get back on to the network to go back to their cars uh, to uh, uh, to go home and to their friends or to their yamcha. Um, but so that needs, so this is a challenge that, uh, that we're facing if we want to get this right. Um, this is just for me being funny, trying to put it all in one slide. Anyway, I have um, said enough. Uh, I've given you a, a good bit of input. Um, I, I think that what we learn in Hong Kong uh, and what we learn with running a high density city and, and putting all the infrastructure in place is something we can export to the rest of the world. Uh, we have great advantages from it with our fantastic mountain sides that are green, uh, that we can easily walk to from our homes, the high density, easy to go they get you shopping, to walk into meetings, to do your business. You don't have to travel very far for anything that you need or any friends you want to see. So great advantages for, for what our city has to offer. But then with that great density that we have created, then the question is, how can we make that a fantastic environment at all these multiple layers below ground, at street level and above ground? And that requires some very serious planning capability. Uh, and for that, we need needs thinking that is documented and that's where it falls short and that's where we need more work thank you thank you paul thank you thank you for giving us an overview on the challenges the unique challenges in hong kong especially with the three di dimensional built environment that makes the conditions walk, walk for walkability uh, much more challenging um so our next speaker um, I'll introduce is uh, Professor Peter Jones. So Peter is Professor of Transport and Sustainability at University College London. His work explores different aspects of uh, urban mobility and its impacts on livability, sustainability and other areas. He advises the European Commission and a number of major cities and national governments around the world and he was awarded an, an OBE for services to the UK National Transit Policy in January 2017. Um, before I hand over to Peter, uh, I would remind uh, every uh, audience, please put your, uh, if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A rather than the chat. Um, I will now hand over to Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justin, and good evening, everybody. So I'll just say something briefly about designing streets for both mobility and livability. Um, and there are four key messages I want to talk about, really. First of all, to say that the policy priorities that we have have a major influence on street design and also can influence travel behaviour. And OECD came out with a report just before Christmas about transport strategies for net zero systems by design and stressed the importance of the road space design and allocation as part of helping us to get towards net zero. As design becomes more inclusive, we need a new set of concepts, principles and tools. As Phil has already said, the road street classification plays an important role in the way we think about the streets, the way we design them. And I'll say something brief at the end about sort of streets in the future. So first of all, policy priorities. We carried out a piece of work, EU study a few years ago, looking at the development of transport policy in capital cities in Western Europe over a 60 or 70 year period, and identified three different 
uh, focus, uh, foci at different points, um, uh, a time when cities were trying to grapple with the car and rebuild the city around the car, um, a time when they focused on sustainable mobility, uh, focusing on efficiency and sustainability, and then when greater prominence has been gained in the placemaking. And those different priorities lead to different uh, types of policy measures. So with a car-oriented city, it's about road building, providing car parking, maybe trying to disperse activities around the network. When you focus on sustainable mobility, it's about improving public transport cycle networks, starting to reallocate some of the road space, the bus or cycle lanes and so on. And then when we think of cities as important places, it's about improving public rail, encouraging street activities, actively restraining traffic uh, and focusing on mixed use developments and so on. And what does that mean in design terms? Well, here's an example from an uh, area just to the east of the City of London financial district. You can see in the 1960s, um, the, the road was reconfigured to provide a large gyratory to maximize traffic capacity with a church stack in the middle there. And then uh, three, three and a half years ago, uh, that was majorly reconfigured with a small uh, a road around the edge, bigger focus on public transport, cycling, and walking access, and providing a large public square there. So the actual space is exactly the same, but because of a different policy focus, then the design of that is different. And we can see that on a more macro scale historically, left-hand side, Portland, uh, Oregon, um, a, an expressway put along the waterfront, uh, which years later when the, uh, the warehousing moved away was replaced by residential areas, they took out the expressway putting them apart. Um, similarly with Seoul, uh, expressway built over a river um, and then 20 years ago now or so that was taken out the river was open up so um, again same amount of space but it's a question of what your priorities are and therefore how that leads to different use of that space and what we also found in western europe is as you change your center of attention from uh, cars and road building to sustainable mobility and actually reducing traffic levels and promoting placemaking then it changes from varying car use to leveling off car use to actually declining car use. And we can see that in this diagram here. It shows the number of the people who make any trips in a day, the number of trips um, they make um, as a car driver. And um, this is from our five cities in, in the Create project. You can see in London, for example, in the late, late 1990s, there were about 1.6 car driver trips per day made by people who were. Um, uh, making trips that day and by uh, around 2010 that had gone down to to 1.1 um, and what we find over that period it was a mode share car driver trips went down from 46 percent to 32 percent well we can see similar trends um, in the other western european capital cities as well but there's also evidence this is happening around the world and, and this first um, uh, chart here is not horizontal is not uh, it's not time it's GDP per capita. And what this shows is uh, on the first collector, it's not just car driver, it's private motorized modal chair. So car driver, car passenger, uh, motorcycle driver, motorcycle passenger. And the horizontal axis is, is GDP per capita. And you can see on the, the left-hand side there where the GDP capacity, uh, capacity is very low, then actually the modal chair percentage is very low because in some cultures, motorcycles are very common, uh, whereas in others they're not. But as we move to cities um, that have higher GDP per capita, you can see two distinct trends. Uh, one more a, a European um, uh, type trend where the private modal share peaks at around 50%, uh, and one which is predominantly, but not exclusively in North America, where the private modal share peaks at around 90%. And what the interesting thing there is for the wealthiest cities, we actually find that um, certainly in the lower diagram there, the wealthiest cities actually have a lower private um, motorized modal share. And that's because they're focusing more on placemaking, trying to make the cities really attractive environments, therefore suppressing and trying to reduce traffic levels and also providing high qualities of public transport, cycling networks and so on. And this data is actually quite old, it goes back to 1995, but we were able to trace it a bit more recently to see in a number of cities uh, what happens over time 
Um, and you can see that that trend, um, as these cities become wealthier, um, in fact, they tend to follow those trajectories. So in, uh, in the States and in Australia, uh, the high level uh, tends to have continued, uh, whereas um, in the European cities, Singapore and Hong Kong as well there, um, you can see that the um, modal share, private modal share has actually been going down over time. So what that says is that your policy focus affects what you implement and what you implement can actually have an influence on behavior and levels of um, private motorized use. <clears throat> Secondly, something briefly about concepts, principles and tools. Phil has already made this, uh, this point about the distinction between roads and streets. And the way I'd put it is effectively roads are more or less expressways where they're only designed for motorized traffic. There are no frontages. There's no need to stop at all. Um, and usually at the, uh, the junctions are grade separated. When you come to streets, and this is the same corridor in London, out of London, in London, it then morphs into a street. You can see there you've got frontage activities. You've got people walking, cycling, crossing the road. Also a need for parking, loading, drop off and so on. So as Phil said, the intensity of activity becomes much greater. Um, and, and the environment's much more intensive. And as part of a European project on road space allegation called MORE, we've been looking at this and thinking about the street as an ecosystem. So essentially in the middle there, you do have the movement of street activity on the carriageway and footway, but under that, you have all sorts of services, gas, electricity, et cetera, also potentially metros that will take some of the pressure off the service network and discussion about using tubes for logistic movement as well. Um, what makes them streets rather than roads are actually the buildings, the frontages on either side that interact with the street, that make the street an attractive destination, and that in turn give rise to the need for stopping activities, uh, for buses, for parking, loading, etc. And then increasingly above the street, we have the airspace, which at the moment becomes important for um, Wi-Fi and also GPS signaling for wayfinding, but in the future may well uh, take off some of the surface pressure through the use of drones for goods um, or private small um, aircraft and moving people. What's interesting is the fact that when you start thinking about the frontages actually generating the attractiveness uh, of particular streets, but also generating the demand for people to come there in general, then we start looking at the fact that a lot of travel is derived demand and actually it's decisions taken in other sectors about what their business models are that actually generate the demand for travel. And interestingly, because of the growing concern about carbon uh, or going to zero carbon, our National Health Service a year ago produced a report for a green NHS and looked at its whole state from scope one, scope two, scope three and beyond um, in terms of the carbon emissions and identified that about 15% of all the carbon emissions from National Health Service actually arise from transport passenger and freight transport, and have now taken a responsibility for dealing with that. As part of the, this uh, MORE project, we've been helping cities by developing some new tools uh, for street planning, street design. One of those is um, a policy intervention sort of toolkit, where we have um, 210 different interventions that you might introduce on the street to help meet the needs of particular user groups. And here's an example of a description for uh, a median strip. Uh, there's there's a, a one page on the description, one page of examples and evidence, uh, one page saying what you know about the effect on road uses, and one on the effect on policy objectives. So that's one thing we've developed to help cities think about alternative elements that they might use in the street to meet particular objectives and the needs of particular users. We've also been developing with um, Buchanan Consulting. Uh, they have a tool called TrackWeb, and we've been taking that further so that can be used by citizens or other stakeholders to, to pinpoint places on maps where they think there are problems and identify what they think those problems are that should be addressed. Also, been working with PTB, we've done VISIM modeling, but we've extended the modeling to look in more detail at curbside activities. Uh, and then now a series of metrics there will, that will measure the efficiency of the use of curbside space the ease of finding the uh, side space. And also if we start charging for space, we'll give an estimate of daily or, or weekly revenues. Um, 
one thing that, uh, that was mentioned is obviously on the footways, we have pedestrians moving, but also street activities like in the bottom left there, people uh, looking at uh, street markets, just chatting on the street, whatever. Um, and again, now we've, we've introduced those more actively into the simulation models. You can actually see if you reconfigure public realm, you can actually have more people there actually uh, interacting in the street environment. And we're also looking at the scope of um, more dynamically allocating street space. I'll come back to that in a minute. So um, again, Phil's mentioned this idea of road and street classification. And I want to just briefly say why this is important. First of all, it shapes how we view this, the street because the way we describe the street is a reflection of what we think it's for. We found that it provides a practical basis for engaging with a wide, wide range of professionals involved in street planning, design, management, operation. It's a paid framework for public engagement and consultation, which is readily understood by participants who see their, their local street, the one that uh, Phil showed us earlier, uh, as, as something that they feel is important for them, as well as being part of a network, it's also a place they want to go to, so they can identify with link or movement in place. It provides a strategic framework for network planning. Um, it provides a basis for selecting performance indicators. What to, for a particular type of street with a certain movement in place function, what do we expect? How do we expect it to perform? And what would we think would be an acceptable level in those performance indicators? It provides a major input to street design, helping to set the parameters for context specific design in different sections of road. It's a guide to asset provision. What sort of facilities should be providing on different types of street in terms of their movement and place function? Um, and what material should we use? And to what standards should we maintain them? And also an input to road street management operation, recognizing different requirements of different users on different types of street and across the network. And the, the Canberra Court 1963 traffic in towns had a very large influence and, and was typical of its time um, in actually defining roads and streets um, very much in terms of their uh, use by motor vehicles. So primary distributors, district distributors, local distributors. And it's only when you got to the, the local roads that there really was the sense, as Phil said, said of actually having frontage activity. And what this led to was what the Canon called a series of environmental areas bounded by roads that were dominated by motor traffic, as we saw in Hong Kong. Um, and also that was in line with the system zoning. So each of these environmental areas had a different primary zone. One might be retail, one might be residential, one might be industrial. And again, that broke up the city into different parts and required movement from one to another, usually by a motorized mode of transport. So the point about link or movement in place is, is this, um, juxtaposition of these two primary functions that the street is part of, of, of a wider network and provides a sort of a conduit for movement. And there the engineers focuses on saving time, whereas as a place, the street becomes a destination in its own right, either on the street or the buildings around the street. And there, a measure of success for the urban planner and designer is that people want to spend more time there. And the, the link is primarily on the carriageway, but not exclusively because of pedestrian and the place is primarily on the footway, although not exclusively because of parking. Um, and here's a very simple uh, classification in London, three by three, three levels of movement, M3 being uh, a very important movement corridor, not just in terms of vehicles, but in terms of people as well. And then P3 being a very important place. And, and a three by three uh, there gives you nine different combinations and each has its sort of characteristics. Um, in fact, in many studies we've involved in, we've been using a five by five matrix, and I'll come on to that in a minute. The important thing about thinking about link and place and also thinking about its role in planning and design is it starts showing the complementary role played by different practitioners from transport planners focusing on link at a planning level to traffic engineers more concerned with link at a design level. And again, with urban planners and urban designers. So within this framework, the different professionals actually have complementary roles and uh, encourage them to work together in teams. Um, this is an example of some work we did in Hounslow um, using a five by five matrix, the inner color representing movement, the outer color representing place. Um, and you can see there that actually over half the network were essentially local streets that were their main for local residents and just for local movement. Another example from Birmingham uh, where a five by five matrix was applied there. And as part of that work, 
They took a series of case studies, so this is Selly Oak, which um, Phil will know, uh, and just set out now what, what's its function in terms of movement in place, and what are the issues there, what are the problems there, and what are the things that we're trying to design for, given that we uh, define the function of that particular street within the, uh, the wider city network. Briefly say something about streets of the future. Um, generally, street usage patterns are becoming more intense. There's more growing competition for use of street space. The demands on our streets are becoming more diverse and more variable. And COVID has actually um, shown in a way how priorities can change quite quickly um, and how streets can be used in very different ways. As part of that, we have new modes presenting challenges, uh, e-scooters particularly, uh, in, in Western Europe and North America, challenging the uh, traditional uses of streets. And because of various advances in sensor, sensor technologies, in booking and navigation services, it means that cities are getting increased data on patterns of demand in real time, which is opening up possibilities of using space much more flexibly and dynamically. And uh, Arup, a large consultancy, um, has came a few years ago, but at the same time we started our European project, came up with the idea of the flex curb concept, so that at different times of day, you might allocate space differently, given that demands differ uh, by time of day. And you can see that, you know, some streets may be relatively quiet during the day, but at night become a center of nightlife, bars and so on. Um, and also streets that might be very busy in the Russia may be very, uh, very quiet at night, so on. And here's an, one of many examples. This is Grid Smarter Cities that have been trialing the idea of a, a virtual loading bay uh, where there's sections of curbside where load uh, stopping is not permitted unless you actually have an electronic, uh, have booked a space electronically uh, where you're allowed to then load or unload there for a given period of time. And this is part of the idea of using the space more dynamically, flexibly, and also starting to charge for curb space. And certainly in, in North America, the phrase about monetizing the curbside um, is becoming quite important with even discussions of charging a small fee for Uber, for example, to drop off and pick up passengers. And this is some work we've just done recently in the uh, UCL's laboratory for Pearl, um, First Pedestrian Environment Activity uh, Research Laboratory, where we just compared conventional roadside LED versions under different lighting conditions, uh, looked at how we might use LED signing as, as road markings or in the curbside there. Uh, and also the uh, example of the um, booking space just now, this is a new sign they're designing to show on street um, whether how those spaces have been booked and by whom. And finally, um, thinking about future challenges and future regulation, uh, the plea for us to be proactive rather than reactive. Traditionally, um, we tend to be rather reactive. So I mentioned e-scooters, they suddenly be developed and then people start scratching their heads and saying, well, how do we accommodate these scooters? So we're always on the back foot. And what we're suggesting as part of more is that we should be proactive, that we should decide what are the main components of our streets. So for example, footway, uh, a lane for cycle traffic and a general carriageway. And then maybe we should define for each of those zones, what are the performance envelopes that we find acceptable in terms of things like a maximum speed, um, audible warning, things like that, maximum weight, maximum size. And then having defined that, it makes it much easier to design the streets for those things. And then if an entrepreneur wants to come along with a new mode, they will know if they want it to be accepted uh, and, and allowed under regulation that it must fit one of those particular performance envelopes. And I think being more proactive with future design will, will result in, in, in nicer cities. So that was it, thank you very much indeed. Um, some of the things I referred to there was part of this project, more multimodal optimization of the road space in Europe. And the, um, if you'd like to go to the website, it's very simple, www.roadspace.eu. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, especially for the uh, potentially uh, potential approach in designing streets um, with the link and play street classification and how it could actually enhance the discussion and uh, to future proof uh, the way how we design for our streets in the future. Um, so now uh, I would like to invite, uh, introduce uh, Anna Rose, our next speaker. 
Anna is an architect and an urban planner with a specialism in mixed use master planning and public space design. Anna is now director at Space Syntax, and she is also an honorary senior research fellow at the Bartlett University College London and an academian at the Academy, Academy of Urbanism, with a particular focus in the design of effective human uh, behavior patterns. Her expertise is in the optimization of spatial layout designs for the benefit of pedestrians and cyclists, as well as the sustainability of local neighborhoods. Now we'll hand over the time to Anna. Thank you very much. I'm just sharing my presentation. Um, yes, so it's great to be here today uh, with all of you. And um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the effect of layout and its implications on the streets. And um, I'm going to talk about more about that, you know, it's not just about the design of the street itself, but the layout of the surrounding city having a profound impact on the character of the space and its role in the movement hierarchy. And in space syntax, that's what been, we've been focusing uh, with the research and uh, the application project. So when we look at cities, we uh, understand them as uh, places for interaction between people. And um, this is the reason why we have cities. This is their extremely high value for society if that uh, can play out in an efficient um, manner in the city. So um, what we try to understand is what are the underlying condition, conditions for creating those cities where that uh, can happen really well. And um, yeah, I'm going to echo some of the comments uh, in the presentations earlier um, in terms of understanding uh, the city as movement systems. And in Hong Kong, we have this three dimensional uh, system uh, where we have a lot of separation of um, different modes of transport on different levels um, and um, a dominance of the vehicle uh, transport on the ground plane, which traditionally in cities is, uh, is really important for pedestrians as well. And then we have these purely pedestrian spaces, which uh, often can be very monofunctional and, and lack the kind of interaction of uh, different things happening in them at the same time. So um, this is not unique um, to Hong Kong. And um, this slide is just demonstrating some principles of understanding um, street spaces. Um, so my uh, language, is, uh, original language is uh, German. So in German, we only have one word, which is uh, Straße, street. Um, so um, on the left, we have here Champs-Élysées. And um, obviously, it's a really important street in Paris. Uh, but what is great about it, it's mixing what we call a global and a local movement function in one space quite successfully. So uh, you have space for cars, but also sufficient space for people. You have trees. You have mixed use um, active front frontages at ground level. And you have a lot of side streets, so it's easy for vehicles to interact uh, from the global network into the local networks, which also makes it easy to take cars uh, from the um, global ne network efficiently. Um, on the right side, we have um, a highway in urban highway in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where we did a lot of work. And it's basically um, a, a purely global uh, movement design space. Um, none of the benefits of the people using the space is uh, translated to the local neighborhood. Um, and um, what we call a suppressed movement economy is the case here because, uh, you know, there's no um, interaction between people on that uh, motorway. In terms of travel time, uh, from my experience in Jeddah, you have a lot of uh, traffic jams at the junctions, so it can take a long time to get around the city, even you have this uh, designated wood um, because it's so difficult to interact with the local network. So total travel time between places might be uh, even less efficient. Um, 
And yeah, where is this coming from? We talked about Le Corbusier's vision uh, with the arrival of the motor car, this idea that everything should be separated, not just the different modes of transport, also the different uses in the city. So before was uh, the market town in the UK, this is uh, Northampton, uh, everything's kind of mixed up, high density um, mix of uh, functions uh, distributed throughout the town. And this is Skelmersdale, a new town in the UK. Uh, where you have a business center and you have the, um, um, the residential neighborhoods and you have an employment center all nicely separated. Then you have a vehicle network, a pedestrian network, everything is separated uh, from each other. So it's a very different experience to live there. And this can be summarized into uh, diagrams here, the integrated city where you have continuously connected neighborhoods. So it's very easy to get from A to B very efficiently. Uh, and you have local centers where the intensity of movement is supporting um, kind of um, retail, local infrastructure and so on. And then you have the fragmented city where you have separate movement networks, you have islands which are connected by these separated movements and it's much harder to uh, get around. And this image of the integrated city, this looks a little bit strange now after two years of the pandemic, um, uh, but in the end, this is, uh, the value why you know people are coming to places uh, to meet to uh, have the interaction and uh, uh, Paul described uh, very nicely the, the effect of the density of the network in Hong Kong making that uh, quite easy. Um, so we see the city as a transaction machine really and spatial networks as enablers uh, for this transaction and um, as we know movement uh, is important for so many other things in cities, land use, uh, as well as issues related to sustainability, active travel, uh, crime, safety, um, energy use, all these things. Um, so understanding the spatial network, therefore, we think is really important. Um, so there's a background to our work in the theory of space syntax, and there's a kind of global community of people um, using this approach um, for the understanding and the design of uh, cities. So we see each place as having a unique spatial signature, and we, in, order, in understanding that helps us to bring the right design um, to the space. So many cities have this what we call a foreground network you can see it in red in london it's like almost like a spider web of all the main woods um, standing out um, and where they come together you typically have transport interchanges in important locations high movement levels are concentrated on this foreground network and then you have the more quiet streets uh, which are more monofunctional more quiet uh, and have less uh, activity on them um, and we know from this uh, research that there's a really good correlation between movement distribution and spatial accessibility values. So more accessible places get more movement. Um, and there's this correlation between land use uh, as well. So we see uh, this very clearly in this uh, map of uh, London. Now we also apply this in the design of places and this is using the King's Cross site in North London as an example uh, to simulate different grid configurations. And you see that if uh, you put in a grid like this, the impact is that this would create a really quiet area because it's very indirectly connected with the major woods in the area. However, a slightly different approach uh, which uh, attaches itself more to the more strategic woods in the area would have a very different result in the hierarchy of the roads. And then uh, that understanding should inform how we design those spaces in red for both local and global uh, activity. Um, so we apply this on uh, design for large urban extensions. Um, and it also helps us to understand things like uh, the value we create when we have the appropriate data available to put that into our model so we can look at uh, the, the impact of highly connected layouts uh, versus the more disconnected layouts and we can show um, that this will have an um, impact on the kind of property values uh, as a result. Um, also there's now a lot of research looking at this in the relationship um, 
to health. So um, certain uh, layout, of course, enables more active uh, movement, makes it easier for people to have an easy, uh, easier uh, active life and therefore be more healthy as well. Um, and this is just a, a, a classic project we, we were involved in showing how this is applied. Um, Trafalgar Square before its redevelopment was also highly segregated uh, pedestrian space in a way with a, a traffic going around it. It was an island very indirectly uh, connected with uh, wider surroundings. And we worked with Foster and Partners on a scheme which introduced a staircase on the northern edge of the square, pedestrianizing the northern edge and create these diagonal routes of movement across the heart of the square and connecting it much better with the surroundings. And this was at the time the CGI of this. And this was very uh, quickly after opening, people have been taking over these spaces. and. What we find is uh, that these changes, they immediately change patterns of behavior because it seems like um, what people can see is um, how they uh, respond in terms of how they move around. Um, and um, more recently, we have uh, started to bring in more other types of data into our models. Um, so uh, typically we have a spatial network information of building densities and land uses and uh, transport networks when we uh, work on these models. Um, but um, very often we uh, get involved in projects where you have major urban infrastructure, this is in Bristol, um, and uh, you want to turn it into more people oriented environment. So this seems to be happening in cities all over the world as uh, Peter described in his presentation, this is a clear uh, trend. We need to address these uh, environments. And um, so we start now to, to layer our spatial models with um, some outcome oriented uh, uh, questions. So um, when we look at a place, so what are the things which are important to people? What are those questions? And do we have data uh, in relation to those and can we layer them into our model? And um, so we have, for example, uh, de developed a measure which we call general revocability, and it's related to the mix of uses. You see here the model is on the plot basis, not on the line. Um, so the color indicates within uh, five minutes of each um, plot how many active land uses can you uh, reach. And um, the hypothesis is that if you have a, a large variety of uses in walking distance, it makes it more walkable place. So this can help policymakers address uh, gaps in, in those patterns. And um, yeah, so we developed this uh, looking at different places, which on the surface might look uh, similar from each other. But then when you do the kind of integrated walkability index, you see that life in them might actually be quite different and on the right side, much more car dependent. Um, yeah, and then there's also a place uh, we think for uh, separating modes. And this is an idea of uh, uh, creating a, a sky cycle system where we use the space above the railways in London to create very direct um, commuter cycling routes into the heart of the city with a very kind of uh, single minded purpose of making much wider part of a greater London cyclable for uh, coming into the, the heart of the city. And you can see they stop uh, at the edges of the inner city where, you know, then um, we have a, a completely shared uh, surface uh, approach. And this should not replace adequate provision uh, on the road surface, of course, but it shows uh, what an impact this could have um, if this was would be applied on, on a larger urban area in terms of saving time and enable more people to cycle to work. Um, yeah, and um, um, just um, in the end of uh, this presentation, um, so the integration of local and global movement at, at GRADE, this seems to be happening everywhere. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, um, can we improve the conditions for that? So um, as others said before, we need to start in those spaces with the needs of uh, uh, pedestrians and cyclists, because otherwise they easily get uh, designed um, out of uh, this. Um, this is an image uh, in Berlin. Um, I use quite a lot because I think um, this 
feels quite effortless in the way that uh, all these things are happening here, which need to be happening. So you, you have local movement, um, pedestrians, you have even stationary activity uh, on a pavement cafe, you have cyclists, you have uh, private vehicles, but also you have public transport, you have uh, um, s S-Bahn uh, train system elevated above the, the main road, taking you out uh, to the outside of the city, to the airport, and uh, very global movement. Uh, you have greenery, you have active frontages at uh, ground level, and um, then you also have uh, a lot of residential population um, supporting all these uh, businesses and, and places. So, um, so this is a street, uh, uh, we have one word in Germany for this. Um, and yeah, so I think and this is really the most important diagram for us to understand the city. Um, and that helps us to understand the each of the streets and what their potential is. Um, so in summary, um, yeah, the layout uh, structures, uh, they create the patterns of longer and uh, shorter uh, trips. And um, the mixing of these different journey lengths actually supports social and economic opportunities. Um, and yeah, the integrated transport system needs to be designed around the needs of the um, pedestrians first. Um, and uh, data can be used to support the understanding and design of those places, um, because that way we can create um, places of very great uh, value for, for society. Um, and uh, yeah, that was my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you. Um, thank you for introducing us the data driven method in understanding uh, walkability, um, especially how um, human oriented cities are. We, we need to understand not just uh, traffic flow, but also in terms of how people would na naturally move uh, based on the, the built environment that they were designed to be in. Um, it's very important for us to um, use data as insights to understand how people would naturally uh, behave in a, in, a, in a system that's created um, in a built environment. So um, now I'll introduce our final speaker, um, Julian Kwong, who will be responding to the panelists' presentations. Uh, Julian is a civil engineering consultant specializing in road safety audit and road um, signage. Besides working in a diversity of uh, road safety projects and advisories in Hong Kong and mainland China, he's also a consultant to the United Nations and the Asian Development Bank on highway safety and design standards. Julian has been advocating for lower urban speed limits and related street design standards in Hong Kong through the Community for Road Safety, an NGO that he has founded since 2004. Uh, Julian, do you have any thoughts um, like for the um, panelists, especially for the presentations about uh, how we should view streets uh, like different from roads or any other thoughts about the presentations. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Justin. I think the talks have been really uh, <coughs> inspiring. And we have different talks I mean, from different experts. And I would like to say that, uh, to summarize, maybe, uh, well, first few, few Jones uh, started with the history of uh, roads and how that has changed our transport system. And then we have lost our streets. And then streets are essentially different that they are emotionally based, emotionally based and based on culture and variability. And he also explained the importance uh, of having street design. And then we, in the UK, that came with the introduction of the menu for streets one. And then we are happy to learn that the menu for street two will be coming up very soon. Uh, I think that is very important. Uh, in Hong Kong, we are coming into the next era of urban development with many new projects, including uh, major new towns and also the revitalization of the existing urban areas. And uh, we really need to have new thinking. I mean, we cannot rely on the uh, traditional thinking, which many uh, speakers have emphasized uh, based on the uh, 
previous, uh, I think, golden rules, you can say, uh, uh, <clears throat> suggested by uh, planners and engineers like the Corbusier and also Buchanan of the fragmented and also uh, separated and also the city based on separation and segregation. Uh, the second talk I think Paul uh, talked about is on our very high in density city and, uh, and how we have been able to manage a, a huge intensity of pedestrian usage through a diversity of multi-level walkway systems. I think Paul is very fair in that we have a lot of success in Hong Kong and uh, that, has, that is uh, due to a lot of effort by engineers, planners, and also uh, all kinds of professionals. But then he also admitted that uh, we still have many deficiencies, for example, at street levels. And there are many small areas which we need to, to think about and to improve our city. I mean, there is a lot of room to make changes. And uh, <clears throat> certainly I agree that uh, again, Paul pointed out that uh, our standards needs to be updated. And uh, it is important that we learn from the uh, speakers today on many concepts which we have not been using in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, uh, I think often projects are based on previous projects. And then we all, always emphasize uh, car usage and the usage of uh, 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 trucks and transport and uh, motorized transport. That is fair in a way in that uh, in Hong Kong, we need to operate very efficiently. But on the other hand, I mean, we are losing many opportunities to have a much better environment, uh, even with the budgets we have for building new cities. Uh, the third talk by Professor, Professor Jones was a focus on uh, four key messages. And I've been listening Link to this uh, very attentively. And I think uh, it's really important that the policies would be needed on sustainability and uh, also in terms of urban streets as an ecosystem, as opposed to uh, motorways and highways, which have single usage. And we also learned from him about the many initiatives by the Center for Transport Studies in the University of London. And, I truly agree the importance of street classification. And I have learned about a lot on the three by three matrix in London. But now I also learned that there is a five by five matrix, which I would be really delighted to uh, learn more about. And uh, Professor Jones also uh, introduced uh, uh, his thoughts about our future streets uh, based on technology and also due to the uh, due to the many changes brought about by COVID. And then I think many of these technologies such as the variable signs for booking lo loading places, I think they're really interesting. And I would like to summarize the last uh, talk by uh, Anna Rose. And Anna uh, emphasized the importance of having connected uh, urban environment instead of the fragmented uh, street design uh, concept which have been in place for so long. I think that the many examples she introduced, including the King's Cross uh, site, uh, the Trafalgar Place, and, uh, and also initiatives in Berlin, and how she has been using the spatial accessibility research tools uh, to actually work out a better plan and to demonstrate to planners and engineers how the street network can be uh, designed in a better way in order to uh, promote walkability, to promote cycling, and to have a better environment uh, for citizens. Uh, overall, I would like to say that uh, this talk has been really good in uh, setting the scene uh, for many of us in the professions, whether we are in planning, engineering, or we work in other areas, and that we have, we need to have a broader uh, insight into uh, what, can be, uh, what can be done to make our city and our future cities to be a much better place to live and to work and to travel. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. Um, it makes me wonder, um, 
in terms of like the 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 discussions that we have or, or the or the discourse that we have today is really uh, a lot of it is about how we view uh, streets different from roads, but um, it's also about how we see um, the roads as a network uh, rather than like uh, just uh, like a network that could uh, also be accommodating to all different kinds of users rather than just for cars or just for motorists. But in, in Hong Kong, um, there's often an ideology or a, meth or a mindset that uh, really puts uh, the very idea of efficiency or uh, so to say car efficiency into the top of the, of the, of the system. Uh, when uh, designers or engineers are dealing with the whole issue or dealing with the whole network. So uh, even how they, even how, how much they want to design for pedestrians, oftentimes it get um, forgotten uh, at the end of the day. Um, what, what would you say uh, for all the panelists, what would you say um, uh, to this um, in terms of how, if we only have so much uh, space um in in hong kong especially we have a very dense environment in hong kong uh how would you convince or how would you um say that why livability is, is important or why uh streets should be seen as a different uh ecosystem rather than just for cars how how would you convince um uh, somebody that may have a different viewpoint on this it's, it might be a very high Oh, uh, it's talking, but not in his microphone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the classic yeah. mistake. I'll, I'll go very quickly because I'm sure I'll always be able to say. I think my, my point would be that cars are very inefficient in space terms. You know, one one person occupying 20 square meters. Um, oh, sorry, no, no, what about 12 square meters? It, it just makes no sense. You know, most cars, single occupancy, um, okay, taxis might have, you know, well, even well, a taxi is effectively, if it's taking one person, it's one car occupancy is extremely inefficient, it is the most space inefficient mode of transport. So, you know, we, we the city, cars blow cities apart, not just when they're moving, but when they're parked. So we, we, we if you've got lack of space, then the last thing you want to do is encourage cars, in my view. If I can drop in there, uh, I, th I, think, I think you have a governance issue. Um, when you know the, the the people that make decisions about uh, about road design in Hong Kong, they're not at the uh, the top of the game um, of what happens in the city, and and so and they don't dare to experiment. And uh, when so they, when they get people complaining in the, at, at local neighborhood level, then uh, basically they back off um, very quickly because you, you, we don't have a mechanism to give them that support, the visionary support for what needs to happen in the city. So th that it, you, the engineers would love to do nice things, but they don't have the tools to communicate uh, and and try out and experiment and, uh, and 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 we had a great example. I mean, we had a an, an old engineer from the transport department, Kevin Luck, who took on the walkability study after we did Walk Twenty One in Hong Kong. Uh, the transport department really went out and did some walkability uh, study work. They did some picked some districts where they did some design work and then you know he wanted to close off a number of streets to make them uh used for pedestrians and then there were a, a couple of people were complaining about that and that whole plan disappeared because he had no way of judging whether that was just one loud mouth complainers are used to the loud mouth and a million quiet people and he had no way to judge that and basically it was all bagged up and um and disappeared and unfortunately exactly in that area somebody was killed by a, a wayward car the other day and uh, it became a major upheaval why it was the pedestrianization plan can't, can't and, and there was no answer for transport department on it so if we do not have a positive decision making infrastructure for it and uh, we have to see with this new political system where we have basically a very different configuration we have to learn whether this is actually going to give us an opportunity to make these changes or whether this makes it even more difficult. So we just, we just don't know yet. Can I add a few points to that? I mean, sure, first sure. of all, I agree with Phil. If you look purely in terms of efficiency, then cars are not a very efficient use of road space. It will be public transport, walking and cycling will be a much more efficient use of road space. Um, but on top of that, that's often not the only objective. We're concerned about um, 
sustainability, public health, etc. And on those grounds as well, active travel linked with public transport actually score much more highly. I think the second thing um, that Paul said was the question about um, who gets involved in the decision or whose voices are heard. And I think in a situation where there is more public engagement, then you get a wider range of voices. And certainly in my experience, in that situation, you get a wider range of voices and not everybody's needs to necessarily be met, but if they feel they've had a say, then you're more likely to reach a consensus on what should be done. And then thirdly, of course, as we said, that streets, um, we've also known as well, that streets are important places. They're, they're centers of economic, social activity, community activity as well. Um, and we know with COVID, the importance of not only physical health, but also mental health, getting out, seeing people and so on. And, and that side of streets is very important. Uh, as Phil said right at the beginning, we, we don't know how to value that. We know how to value delay to a car on a network. We don't know how to value the benefit of a wider footway. So people come out there, they meet people, they spend money locally, but also it's good for their mental, physical health and so on. There's a lot of work needs to be done there to get that balance right, I think. Sorry, Anna. Yeah, I would also say that, you know, just adding more lanes will not make the problem go away because the problem of induced demand. So um, even if, um, you know, the car lobby get all their way, they still end up with cities where it's very difficult to get around, even for the cars, uh, as the example of Jeddah and many other very car oriented cities show. Um, you know, what is the goal here? The goal is for people to get around effectively in the city and uh, just the car is not the solution if you look at the evidence. Yeah, certainly in, in Hong Kong, it seems to be big because Hong Kong, we uh, we obviously have about um, like close to 90% of daily uh, journeys that are made by actually made by public transport. So it it, it appears to uh, to us that it, it might be uh, what, what I've gotten from this is that it, it might be it might make sense to prioritize more for uh, other modes rather than cars, especially in a, in a dense city like Hong Kong. Um, so then um, I, I will start taking some questions uh, from uh, the, uh, the Q&A section. So uh, one of the top questions that we got um, voted is that, uh, do you think segregation of the people uh, towards the bridge network is a good thing? Um, where do we take uh, on uh, making walking comfortable or making people engage to the streets for well-being if we do this do what to do with less uh, desirable walking conditions like space or weather or cover in terms of basically how how does uh, segregation fit um, in the in the context or do you think it's a good thing or bad, bad thing or how do we make it more integrated to the road system any any thoughts from the I'm happy to start because I was showing you central of Hong Kong and, you know, this whole issue of the ring roads being around the harbour rather than under the mountains and where the buildings are and so on. I mean, we have a, a weird config, configured system. So we have to deal with these main roads coming through these areas. Uh, we can't get away from that. Uh, it, it's your biggest interchange in terms of uh, road traffic with, uh, with train traffic and bus traffic and so on. Um, and so if you, in that case, it, it's very good to get people away from the street, away from that congested and busy area. But then you have to make that old, new network to be as good as the street level. And if, this, if it's as good as the street level, but without cars, it's even better. Um, but if it's a singular little footbridge that you have to climb up, you know, you're living in a village on one side of the road and the MTR station is the other side of the road. And the only way to get to the MTR station is to climb up the skinny footbridge. Then every day is a chore because you're not allowed to cross the road at street level. Um, and, um, you know, I, I mentioned this because we had a specific example where people were crossing between the village and the MTR station through the planter uh, in the middle of the road. And we asked them to make a crossing and when the transport department was alerted, they put a big massive railing to force people to use the footbridge above because there was a footbridge already. 
so so there are there are you've got to be very specific to the circumstance on where that footbridge makes sense and where it doesn't make sense but if it's part of a very well connected network that makes that elevated network better than the street level well why not it's perfect plus you've got so many people in the street in central hong kong that you've got to cater for with so many cars you have to work at multiple levels if you put if you take away the multiple levels you can't move around the street level anymore so you need multiple levels for movement so uh i, I think that question needs 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 a, it's a lot of very circumstantial but an individual footprint of course is ugly so it, it, it's more about the whether the it makes sense for the circumstance and also whether you give the choice in the right place for people to choose um so Phil, I see your hand up first. So yeah, I, mean, I, I, I kind of I, I I I take some of what Paul is saying, and I think yes, you know, you, you and, and Anna may have a view. You know, the, the, if you apply um, space syntax to the pedestrian network as it is a three D pedestrian network, it's very illegible and and you know very difficult for people to find their way and and not at all inclusive. So yeah, yes, of course, if you could create the perfect. Um, pedestrian network well integrated or on the level that that's not at the street then you've you know can you kind of relegated the cars almost to underground but I just think we'll never I think we'll never get there actually and I, and I, and I did I, I kind of yeah maybe your main roads and there probably are roads perhaps it's going to be very difficult although with road pricing you know just because you've got a lot of traffic on those roads does it have to be there how much of that traffic could be taken away if you were to change your policies. You know, maybe it's maybe it's, it's not forever. But then we've got a whole the whole kind of um, secondary street network that is still, from from what I've seen with 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 the railings and the segregation space, the the car is still kind of very dominant on those streets. And if we could, e if Hong Kong could even begin by reclaiming some of its quieter streets, it's less busy streets in, uh, introducing 30 kilometer or even 20 kilometer speed limits um and and really making the pedestrian the priority on those streets you know if, if, if they are just low volumes of car movement i, I mean i remember going into one super block in in um in in part of hong kong and even the the little roads that, and they were roads you know inside the the perimeter block still had guard railing there's hardly any traffic on those roads and 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 there were people coming out of the tower blocks to kind of um socialize but yet the 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 language of segregation was still really strong even on those very very quiet streets and let's think about how can we begin to roll it back and maybe in time tackle the tackle the big roads but start at the at the at the quiet end of the network and just begin to change the the paradigm i think um would be good thanks um anna or uh peter if you guys want to which one you go to um and please I'm mute. Um, so I would just like to mention that I think what we found is that uh, generally people are a bit lazy and they value convenience. So uh, they don't like to go up somewhere when they know they need to go down again. Um, that just seems to be human nature. Now in Hong Kong, you have the kind of three dimensional to, um, topography as well. So it can be easier when you're already on a higher level just to continue through on that level, for example, to the ferry uh, terminal because you're already higher up. And I think that can be made, uh, this can be workable uh, in places. But we also have in London, we have the Barbican Center, which is um, a whole complex cultural and residential complex on a higher level. And we did detailed uh, studies of this. and. It's just the fact that um, movement levels at street level, you know, are always much higher than on the podium. So they had uh, really struggled with um, getting shops work on the podium level. Uh, for example, even the pedestrian environment is, is much uh, nicer. Now, um, you know, there is a role for global fast moving traffic through or around parts of cities. And that doesn't mix with um, pedestrian activity that's dangerous. Um, I think there are examples, for example, in um, Barcelona, where they also have the main highway along the, or they had the main highway along the coast. What they did, they partly buried that underground, um, but they also kept, they transformed the street level into a boulevard. So you also have that mix of city-wide and local 
uh, traffic in the city and people can now much more easily cross and get to the waterfront um, so it's almost like a compromise so they um, the element of through traffic is buried now someone who just wants to go through and out of the city at the other end takes a tunnel bit um, the person who wants to you know access by car certain parts of the city can stay on the street level and they're now pedestrian crossing so i think something like this or study other cities with similar conditions might be interesting for Hong Kong. Right, so there, there might be a way of doing a compromise between the two to, to kind of like balance between livability and efficiency. So what about your view, uh, Peter? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, as um, Anna said, I mean, the Barbican post-war was an attempt in the city of London to introduce this segregation, which is an example of what the calendar had come up with, but um, it was dropped there quite soon afterwards. It wasn't extended to the rest of the city, um, partly for the reasons that Anna said, it wasn't felt to be very successful. Although, as she said, where you've got a, um, a city that's very hilly, then in a sense there is scum, I think there's more scope to do that. But I think there's a question about um, whether those environments are very sterile, because often they're privately, if, if you start moving into creating a street in the sky, if you like, they tend to be part of private developments. And, uh, you know, sometimes they're a bit more sterile or, I mean, the, the attractiveness often of, of, of a street is the fact you've got a mixture of self-employed businesses and a range of activities. Um, and it's difficult to create that where one organisation, I think, owns everything. You don't get that spontaneity in the same way. Obviously, as well, for some people um, who have very limited mobility, then the ability of getting uh, in a car or taxi and being dropped outside the hairdresser or something, you know, is often quite important. Whereas when it's all pedestrianised, you, you, you can't do that sort of thing. Um, two other quick points. One is the whole issue around, if you like, what we call community severance. You've got busy road, people can't get from one side to the other. Um, and we've done some work and actually put a value on that, uh, or you know, a disutility on that, which I think has made people take it a bit more seriously. But it's still quite common in, in, even in places like London. You'll, you'll find a dual carriageway with guard railing with a bus route and there were a bus stop on each side of the road. And you think, well, somebody's got to cross the road in one direction or the other, but there's no provision for crossing the road. So I think, um, you know, even in many Western Europeans, it hasn't really been properly thought through. I think the other point I'd make as well is, is it depends where the onus is as well. You know, if you said, for example, um, well, the surface level ought to be pedestrians, the road network ought to be underground. People say, well, that's really expensive, we can't afford it. Um, it's much cheaper to put up a pedestrian bridge, but it, which is true, but it depends what your base level is. And what we've been discussing recently in one case is that you've got, for example, in, in, in rural areas, you've got roads going through villages with a 30 or 40 mile an hour speed limit, but very little pedestrian footway. And the argument is, well, it'd be quite expensive to put pedestrian footway. And, and my argument is, well, it shouldn't be a cost on the pedestrian you should say all settlements that have traffic going through should have footways. If they're not there at the moment, the maximum speed limit is 20 miles an hour. And that would slow traffic down a lot. If you want it at 40 miles an hour, you can then show the time-saving benefits would pay for the, for the footway, for the pedestrian. The question of which way you present the arguments and everything at the moment is orient, oriented from the car driver point of view. If we have other standards around sustainability, around placemaking, use that as our base, then I think the, the economic arguments become different. Thank you. Uh, Julian, do you have any? Yes, I think in Hong Kong, uh, the questions of great separation for pedestrians, and there is no doubt for uh, major highways. I mean, we, we have been doing that uh, a lot because that's probably the only way. Only we hope that, uh, especially for new towns, that the routes are uh, uh, designed uh, according to the terrain I mean, so that pedestrians do not need to walk up a lot or descend a lot into the ground. Uh, but uh, even if we have a lot of these great separated uh, connections, the reality is that we have so many uh, great streets. I mean, it's not possible to have great separation everywhere uh, because we need them for loading and loading for pedestrians to walk along. And uh, it's no point to, I think, to assume that we can have uh, segregation or great separation everywhere. So the next question is, how 
can we do that? I think the con uh, which Phil mentioned about having 30 kilometers per hour or 20 kilometers per hour is crucial. Uh, without adequate traffic calming and speed limit, uh, the streets in Hong Kong are often dangerous. I'll give you some examples of my experience as a road safety auditor. Uh, we have been commenting on many projects in Hong Kong, including urban developments. And I find that uh, often we have contradictory uh, requirements. For example, uh, in order to cater for traffic, uh, turning out from a side street, uh, designers may be tempted to put two lanes. So two lanes of traffic can go out from a side street, turning right and turning left, but that is at the expense of pedestrians. And the other uh, example is uh, I work on uh, in a rural areas with village access. And I asked the designer why they introduced such a large corner radius in the village. And they told me that uh, it was a requirement of the authority to allow for 12 meters long vehicle to make the turn without encroaching onto the opposing lane. And I find that is, that is a really a common criteria to be applied in many circumstances. And, uh, and on a, another occasion, I tried to recommend for 30 kilometers per hour, but since I'm working only for one street or two streets, I mean, often because of the design standard and policy, and often they are simply rejected. So uh, I think in Hong Kong, uh, having reduced speed limits is the start. We cannot rely uh, solely on having build out footpath widening and also constructing lifts and elevators to solve the urban safety problems. We need to have a multi-dimensional approach of which uh, lower speed limit is crucial. Thanks, Julian. Um, yes, yeah, it, it, it's no wonder that um, it, in, in the basis of like the, the street is not just um, limited in central, but it's all, uh, all parts of uh, Hong Kong that we also need to look at that. Um, there are a lot of places that we can't just uh, go with the segregation. Um, Paul, I see your hand up first. Um, do you have any views on this? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, we have in some areas in the city such a density of activity and, and people that working with multiple layers is a good thing. And when I promote an elevated network in central, that doesn't mean that you should completely annihilate the ground level. I'm not proposing you try to do what Seattle did by putting up this, these, these skylines or these, these walkways that they did, uh, the skywalks or whatever that was called, and that they cancelled them later on because there were so few people left on the street level that, that the murderers and rapists were on the street level and they had all these problems and then they had to kind of stop it and repopulate the street because they kind of the street became danger zones because so few people were there except for the people that, that were not allowed anywhere else. So I mean, you can... You don't have that. You, you've got to make sure that the street level keep working. Uh, you've got to make sure that they continue to be functional. These buildings will have interfaces at street level and at elevated level, but you give people choice. Um, when I go in central and it rains, I use this, the elevated network and whether it's beautiful weather and I have to rush around uh, and I need to go to the little shops and the little side lane, then I use the street level. There is a choice. There's quality in that choice and then having that choice. So. It's so again, I, I, it's not a one or versus the other. And I think that could be easily not as well understood as, as it is here in Hong Kong um, because of you know other environments where you do not have that amount of people. Uh, it's so, uh, but of course, I mean, I can also give examples in Hong Kong where we've done the elevated network like Kowloon Station and we've annihilated street level entirely. Street levels dominated by uh, uh, bus station entrances, car park entrances, uh, the exhaust vents from the air, from the air conditioning systems. There is no reason the, the pedestrians are completely forced away from that building because it is completely a disaster zone uh, of, of, with, with what they have created there. So yes, you, you, the rule, it must be that if you create this elevated network, that you should never ever give up on the ground level. You should never ever give up on the opportunities that you've got anywhere in the building and in the, and, and the connection with the, uh, the public space. Oh, by the way, I put here behind me a picture 
where uh, to show that our highways department doesn't always get it right in terms of uh, providing spaces. This is a small street where uh, uh, everybody's walking between two villages uh, along a major uh, along a road, and they all have to walk in the road uh, on the, because there's no pavement. And I cannot get the transport department to put pavement here because it would narrow the street. You so, say. <laughs> Just a giggle. I'll, I'll, I'll use my background to put little photographs of at a time as we go on. Um, we we seem to uh, be running out of time, but I, I see some of uh, the panelists are answering the questions uh, in text. Um, we will also try to uh, gather all the questions uh, in Excel format and circulate around uh, to panelists and, and see if they could be answered and sent over uh, to the uh, to all delegates. But um, Peter, do you have any uh, follow-up thoughts on uh, what Paul said? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to Julian's point about speed limits. Um, when Transport for London was first set up 22 years ago, the, they're responsible for the main roads in London, the Transport for London road network, 580 kilometres. Um, they would not have a speed limit of less than 30 miles an hour, and a lot of it was at 40 miles an hour or above. Um, whereas now there are several key sections where the speed limit is 20 miles an hour. And what's made the difference is this idea of thinking about the streets as being for movement and also places. And they recognise where you've got an intense place activity, traditional high street on a, on a major road in London, because of the intensity of activity there, because of concerns about public health and, and traffic safety, they've now accepted there are, there are a need for 20 mile an hour sections, even on the main road network in London. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Phil? Are you, uh, you haven't unmuted. Uh, yeah. I keep doing that. Um, no, I, I, I'll be very quick because I know we are uh, over time, but I was just going to mention uh, on that question, it, I, I touched very briefly on Wales and the approach it's taking to setting the default speed limit of 20 miles an hour, 30k in urban areas. And uh, obviously not every street will be suitable, so there will be some that should be remain 30 miles per hour, 50 kilometres an hour, but the, the um, parameters that the Welsh Government is using um, are entirely based on the place activity uh, that, that, that is there on those, on those corridors. It's not taking account of existing speed. I think um, systems that base speed limits solely on 85th percentile, what they effectively do, they only give the decision on what the appropriate speed is to the driver. No, no one else effectively has a has a vote. Um, it's it's drivers are voting with their with their foot. Um, so so what Wales is taking that that kind of place led approach, which as as Peter said has been used in in London. So we're very interested to see how how that plays out in about uh, fifteen months time when it goes across the whole country. Gillian. Uh, uh... Yes, I think the current problem is that we have a lot of objections to lower speed limit people do not understand. And really, as NGO, we need to spend a lot of time trying to uh, convince the groups who are uh, very much against uh, this kind of concept. Uh, I think we need to target, for example, the legislators and even the local uh, societies in uh, among professionals. Uh, uh, I think the problem is that not enough people understand the need and therefore it has not been widely supported in the society, but we cannot just wait uh, until say 10 or 20 years ago. I think we need to continue our work and uh, experience from other countries and also from London would be really useful. And I hope that Phil and uh, other experts can also keep us informed uh, of any uh, <clears throat> latest finding in the future. Thank you. Be pleased to. Um, same, same point as, as yeah. Julian. Um, so the objections here from the community, we got math, they don't understand lower speed limits and they think and they, the, 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 what they tell us is, but then it will take longer for the bus to get there. And, and that's, that is the biggest obstacle we have in gathering an understanding for better streets. Yeah, I, I've also seen uh, some delegates uh, reflected um, the the worries about um, how speed limited and also lane capacity are reduced, higher delay and lower uh, level of service will occur. And um, they are upset how it would uh, 
they're, they're, they're worried how it would upset people for a lower mobility uh, um, that that might uh, make. Um, yeah, so it I think it's a quite common concern still in, in Hong Kong about about these these issues. Uh, maybe just uh, another point would be how the question is asked, um, because if we ask these questions in isolation, people think about them in isolation. So it's hard for them to, you know, make these kind of considerations which are about a wider range of uh, topics. So um, I think it's really important that um, basically this is a political question about uh, what kind of city do we want to live in? And uh, not just uh, in terms of transport arrangements, but you know, what kind of lifestyles, uh, how important is public health to us? Do we think, uh, you know, we, we need to do something about this? And, and I think if it's described to people in those terms, um, with the kind of wider goal of what kind of place we want to have, um, they understand better, um, and um, it's a, a matter of education um, and having a discussion uh, which includes a wider range of things, I think. So it's about the, the way of, um, of explaining to the public, especially how to, to, to allow for an imagination and how um, do we want to prioritize prioritize livability or not, or how we approach uh, public health in a, in a comprehensive way, um, uh, including transport in, in, in the future. Um, maybe there might be a short, uh, maybe we can answer one more question in, in a short fire uh, manner. Um, so th there's been a question about, um, because there are a lot of streets, even though there are side streets that are in Hong Kong, there are uh, about 10,000 vehicles day, uh, for AADT in an in a average daily uh, traffic. So um, how, how, do you, how, how would you suggest to manage the curbside activities in there, especially how um, to retrofit them? Because um, car use is not going to be uh, lower uh, in it in in a short period of time it it might take time to actually uh, make car use uh, to to reduce to a point that is acceptable uh, so how there might be a there might be a time that uh, would be quite challenging in terms of managing those uh, problem um, how how do we reverse car use when the uh, current road is already very busy any any thoughts behind about, about that or how street design would actually be uh, fitting into this. Uh, Peter? Well, as I mentioned, in London, the, the reduction in car use was fairly rapid. Uh, over a, a decade or so, the, the modal share went down from 46% down to 32%. So it can be relatively quick. But having said that, to answer your question specifically, I, I think a good starting point um, is to take um, a small number of streets and do a demonstration project um, to actually take out capacity on those streets um, and, and see what happens. It's not just in terms of what happens to car traffic, but if it brings those streets back to life. Um, and the problem often is when we talk about taking cars out, people think, oh, well, you know, we're, we're losing the carriageway space. If you show that the carriageway space is being put to better use, um, and as a result of that, that environment is more, is better, it's more attractive, et cetera, then it changes the nature of the argument. So for example, in Edinburgh, when they closed, wanted to close the Royal Mile to general traffic, they did it first of all on summer weekends to actually show that you could make better use of that space. And gradually the owners of the shops and other people actually could see they, they made more money, more people came there, et cetera. So I think some demonstrations, some limited demonstrations and building on that might be a good starting point. Um, any other thoughts by any panelists? No, no, I mean, I think, you know, of course, you know, as, as Paul said, um, the, the sheer density of, of, of people you have there means that, that there is a, a demand for traffic, but um, how much of that demand, how much of that, those journeys are, are essential? There is always, there is always 
there are always journeys that are made um, at the margins. You know, the, 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 there might be an alternative. It could be walked. It could potentially, even on the level, could be cycled if conditions are better. There must be some journeys that are unnecessary um, made by car. And, you know, if, we, if, if the approach is to continually expand the capacity, as Anna said, you know, the, that, that will induce demand. The, the opposite of that is to begin to gradually take away capacity or use road pricing just to make some of those marginal journeys less attractive to make by car and begin to bring traffic volumes down. So some, some authorities are now, um, the Scottish government has um, uh, announced a policy, uh, it will aim for a 20% reduction in car travel per capita. Wales is looking at 10% um, uh, in those cases because of climate change. Um, but just generally, you know, the, 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 the idea that the car use is, is going to grow, the traffic is going to grow. Some authorities are beginning to put in targets and say, we must now begin to plan and design new whatever tools that we can, whether that is reallocating road space or, or, uh, or using pricing or improving the alternatives of gradually bringing down that level of, of car traffic. And, you know, the question, I guess, is uh, to what extent can that be done in Hong Kong? And I, I can't imagine that the answer is zero. There must be some scope to reduce reduce the volume of, of car traffic that you have. Uh, Paul? Yeah, I, just, I, I think you've got to keep in mind that Hong Kong has been a closed city for a very, very, very long time. And we have just built a, a very large capacity of, of uh, road connections with the mainland. And that will induce a lot of new car ownership in the city. And so we're going to have pressure in that sense. And I'm not sure you can stop that, but for that particular use. So you really have to work on the local district level to kind of keep cars out. And, and I think time management for the for areas is going to be important. Uh, we start closing off areas for particular times of the day uh, and keep the cars out. And then people then get used to it and they start to enjoy it and they start to prefer it. And then they will want the hours to be changed or improved. The counter argument that is though, that we've had this in a particular shopping street in Mong Kok, and that attracted so many people that it became so noisy that the residents living above the shops started to throw acid down the, from their balconies and hurt people. And in the end, the whole thing became mayhem and the government then retreated and opened up the street again to calm down the street. So traffic was calmer than having lots of people walking around shopping. So we, we have some specific unique situations here because the pressure is so great that the moment you create a bit of pressure space, it, you get a lot of people on it. So how to, how to manage that uh, actively? And I think it's time management, but time management requires good city management. And for good city management, you need some great leadership uh, in the city and lots of communication with the city. And as long as leadership here is distracted with other 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 work that a mayor of London doesn't have to deal with, um, then you just have limited capacity at, to, at the top of government to, to achieve these things. So uh, that's that's our biggest challenge, I think, in, in making the cities better. So it's it's important to um, bring up people's appetite for a livability, a livable street or livable places first before uh, by by these all sorts of like trial approach to 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 make people get used to it. So uh, what about Anna? Yeah, uh, just to say maybe, you know, there might be some really good reasons why many people want to take the car for certain journeys. And maybe it's important to look at that. So why is that uh, we know that people choose the car when it's the most convenient way of doing something? Um, can we look at, you know, how can we make the other things more convenient? Um, and you know what are the obstacles to the other things and then um, automatically when other ways of getting somewhere are more convenient than using the car I mean no one in uh, London I know would uh, who works in central London would have the idea of going to work by car uh, because everything else is just more convenient uh, so you don't even think about it so I think that's another angle, uh, accepting there might be good reasons and obstacles for people to choose other modes um, and addressing that first so people naturally feel that the need much less to use the car. Right, yeah. Um, it's, it's really to, it, I think it's the first step to, like for the, for the transport department uh, in Hong Kong to be able to 
collect those data because like coincident coincidentally the transport department in Hong Kong is um, commencing uh, a transport uh, traffic and transport strategic study in the coming year and also uh, they're also commissioning the travel uh, characteristics survey uh, this year which they uh, the last time they have done is uh, 2011 so is it is it again the new uh, th this year they're gonna uh, do that again for for the forecasting in the future so they're doing these two things uh, coincidentally to try to gather those numbers and uh, let's hope that um, the tran the transport department in Hong Kong and also the authorities uh, above would be able to um, start collecting these data and start um, considering uh, whether what kind of car trips could be could be reduced or if there are any other ways of um, uh, to to plan the city to be a more livable uh, way. Um, Peter, do you have any uh, thoughts? Yeah, just a quick one. There's another thing that comes up quite a lot as well, which is that shopkeepers and businesses actually say that it's the car drivers that spend most money and therefore they'll lose out if they don't get car drivers. What the experience shows is that they're right and they're wrong, that actually per trip, car drivers do spend more money often than people by bike or foot or bus, but they travel there more less frequently. So over a week or month, the people that spend most money are the pedestrians. Uh, they may spend less each day, but they go there each day and, and bus users. And it's often pedestrians spent most on a monthly basis, then bus passengers, then cyclists and motorists last. So it's also a question of really understanding what's going on and whether the perceptions that, that shopkeepers and others have a, a right or wrong as part of the discussion. I'm conscious of the time. Um, so um, it's almost time for us to draw a close to today's uh, discussion. Um, the, I, I see that there are uh, some remaining questions. We will uh, circulate uh, these questions uh, in Excel uh, to the panelists and uh, get back to uh, all the delegates in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a reply uh, with email and also uh, together with the recording link to this uh, today's session, um, so uh, it should be done in the in in the next few days uh, or a week after uh, or uh, after our second panel uh, as well. Uh, so uh, don't forget to sign up for the second panel, which uh, will be held on Thursday at the same time. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for everyone's uh, joining. And also especially thanking uh, all the panelists uh, who joined us today. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And uh, I will um, I wish you a, um, a happy day uh, today. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Bye. Thanks, Justin. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Fantastic. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.